And if I could add, uh, sometimes I don't exactly call myself a global citizen, more like a location agnostic, uh, where <laughs> sometimes it doesn't really matter which latitude and longitude I'm at, I, uh, except that I do need internet wherever um, I stand. So. Uh, like I said, my name is Juliana. You can find me on Twitter uh, at Afromusing, but also my site is julia.na. Um, there's a whole other story of how I got that domain name, but that's not what we, why we're here today. Um, why we're here today is I'd like to share uh, some thoughts about ecosystems, access, and creating opportunity. I will leave you at the end of the talk with three things that I've learned that I'd like to share with you from the Ushahidi perspective. Uh, that I hope uh, can, can add to the conversations that we're having today. So one of the key things that I learned very quickly, um, I was from Kenya uh, in East Africa, and uh, one of the, you know, I, I learned a lot of things from my grandmother. Uh, in fact, my own personal motto is make, fix, or help, uh, and help others. And, more often than not, you just have to look around you and solve the problems uh, where you are. Because there are lots of global challenges and lots of problems all around the world. However, the, the, the first step is to look <coughs> around you, uh, what's closest to you, uh, what are the issues uh, around you. And the way we started Ushahidi was just by that, by looking around us and seeing what was the problem. In 2008, the problem was information flow. Uh, I was in Eldoret, which is uh, one of the was one of the flashpoints of the violence. It was up country in Kenya, and we were not there, there wasn't much information on TV. Uh, when you turn on the TV, they actually had the sound of music, which was crazy because it was a very difficult time, and that's a, that's a time you really wanted information. So some of us turned to BBC, but then also to the internet, where there was a, uh, a nascent blogging community. We're talking several years ago, uh, 2008. So um, since then, fast forward a couple of years, uh, the first prototype of Mushahidi uh, showed the use case, and we worked on a couple of other use cases around uh, Africa and other parts of the world. And the biggest use case was in 2010, after the Haiti earthquake. But I'd also like to just show you the capabilities of the software, specifically for an environmental disaster that happened in Louisiana in 2010. Let's watch. It is one of the longest running deployments of Ushahidi that I know of. Uh, there's another one that is quite long running um, that touches on the Syrian crisis. <coughs> Um, to think about how technology can be used to bear witness, uh, the word Ushahidi means testimony or witness in Swahili. Um, if you'd asked me in 2008 how this piece of technology could have an impact or could be relevant to Louisiana in the United States, I, like Barbara, would say you are smoking something. Um, <laughs> but this is the thing about open source software and about uh, the uh, about opening up, uh, uh, opening up and inviting other people to use your tools, and to also uh, join in the communities who are trying to uh, crowdsource information <coughs> on the problems. And we didn't realize this that uh, most people, uh, Nathaniel Ballard, who writes for uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, when he looked at our work, kind of summarized it. Um, by saying that most use technology to define function, we use function to drive the technology. And what that reminds me today is that we need to fall back in love with problems uh, and stay grounded in, in creating solutions that matter. Um, so this Oshihidi is also not just a piece of software, it is a global movement and a, a global community, including some of the most amazing translators here in in uh, Germany, uh, whenever we have uh, a new product or uh, whenever the Ushahidi platform needs to be translated, the German translators do it the fastest. Uh, so you can download the Ushahidi 
platform in German, thanks to the amazing translators who are here in, um, in Deutschland. And um, there's a community of many others around the world. And since 2008, um, the uses of the Ushahidi platform have grown from uh, crisis maps to election maps to corruption maps, uh, environmental monitoring like I showed earlier. And uh, from its roots in Kenya, it is now global with the software being used or tested in over 150 countries and available in more than 40 languages. Um, what surprises me about this growth is that it wasn't an act of legislation, it wasn't an act of the UN. It is something that just went out in the world and just reverberated. We didn't have a marketing budget. We didn't start out with any money at all. We just started out with a prototype. And um, we didn't start out with any defined leaders. Uh, I was a coder in Chicago when I joined as part of the Ushahidi team. And um, that this thing that started uh, in what you could say the edge of the network uh, is now part and parcel of how we process information. Uh, I think uh, is a testament to how important the internet is and how transnational <coughs> networks of information flow are really, really important in this day and age. Uh, more information on Ushahidi. Uh, so it's <coughs> from just uh, a, soft, a, 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 com a not for profit company that makes software. Uh, we've already created, we've also created tools like Ping, which helps to communicate, uh, helps families or teams to communicate during crisis. Um, that's also very grounded uh, in the experience that we had in Kenya. And we've got a new product called CrisisNet or Ushahidi Data Studio. Uh, we'll have more of that information later. But the thing that was interesting that I'll touch on in a few minutes is this idea of Ushahidi as a catalyst. Um, and one of the problems that uh, we realized uh, after we set up Ushahidi was that the nascent technological community in Kenya that was very key in supporting our earliest efforts in that prototype, coding, setting up the website, uh, telling other people, adding information, that community did not have a base. We did not have a base. We would often meet in supermarkets, which ironically, well, strangely, in Nairobi, there's this one supermarket that had free Wi-Fi. So we actually went there, and we would meet there, and do our meetups there, and co-work there, and come up with ideas, and do stuff there. So uh, as Ushikidi, with Eric Hersman, my co-founder and business partner for a really long time, decided to move all the way from the US with his whole family. Uh, and we created a base in Nairobi, and that is the innovation hub of Nairobi. Uh, this innovation hub, apart from being named as one of Fast Company's uh, most innovative ideas for last year, which was a big honor, uh, it creates a place where you can share. And uh, it's, it's, it creates a space where we now have more than 150 startups that came out of the space. Uh, two are exiting in a very big way uh, this year. Uh, there'll be some news about that. Uh, but the thing is, Communities sometimes just need space. And one of the preconditions, or at least one of the ideas that it hints to me is that you need, as one of the preconditions for progress, there needs to be space for uh, community space, for innovation space, for collaboration, uh, and even maybe space just for coffee to encourage serendipity, where this is where you can find your co-founder, or this is where you can find your business mentor, or this is where you can find uh, other people who can help your, your, your business or your community grow. And uh, we will be celebrating our five-year anniversary on Saturday. That's why I'm not spending much time in Munich, sorry. Yeah. I, love you. I love the city. But uh, yeah, we're really excited about this and that it's growing. Uh, there are now 16,000 members. Uh, and we started out with a floor, with the, a, a concrete floor, um, and the only thing we had was a fast internet connection that was donated by Safaricom and Seacom. So it's a really big year for us, and um, the big thing again is community and space to be. And uh, the thing is, from Ushahidi as a platform, 
to the iHub as an emerging um, space. It encourages growth of ecosystems, right? So once you have a space, you also have to think about what is what does a healthy e ecosystem look like? There's some healthy innovation ecosystems like those in Cambridge, uh, healthy ecosystems like those in Silicon Valley or um, the uh, Silicon Roundabout in London, uh, and I think uh, the hubs in Berlin. They're, these are really interesting spaces. And um, my team and I are inspired by the flow between the iHub and paragons of technological innovation like MIT Media Lab. We recently had students, faculty, and even the director come and spend some time with us in Kenya. And um, this is the thing about doing that. It, it helps to put us in a different construct to learn about the different problems in a different environment and to come up with solutions together. And the collaboration and flow with others can really help to, to, to make things a little bit more complex between when you connect different ecosystems. I think that's when you can see some interesting outcomes. Uh, some of the outcomes from this collaboration were an app uh, that is helping rangers out in Savo National Park to help deal with the poaching problem, which is uh, a really big problem in uh, East Africa, but also in other um, African countries. And um, one of the things that I'd like for you to, to learn from us is that uh, the collaborations that bring you joy, that continue to help you learn, and that open your world to different realities uh, are really important in helping to, 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 to have that progress, to just complicate your world a little bit by working with people across, uh, across cultures and across time zones. You can do that either through open source software, but then also through collaborations between universities. And uh, one of the quotes that we really like when it comes to ecosystems is this one by uh, Joey Ito, that we live in an ecosystem now. The solution to many problems will not be a single aha moment, uh, but the cumulative effect of work done together in a network. So this tells us that we really need to pay attention to the network effect of uh, our work and our strategies. Uh, because for us to have progress, what are we, what are, are we joining the dots? Right, uh, and um, it, it gives us an opportunity to change things if we can uh, make things a little bit more complex and you can join the dots. It's never that simplistic, and like, said, like it was said earlier, it all depends. And um, coming from Africa, there's a lot of, uh, let's do this for Africa. Let's do this for, 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 for. The thing is, with, design or uh, with ecosystem that's really about doing with, not for. Because with uh, brings in the diversity of experience, the diversity of ideas, and the diversity of input that can help us come up with better problems. Design for assumes that you need what that person needs. Uh, it assumes that you know what that person needs. It's very simplistic and typically that's how we end up with wrong-headed designs or uh, really ridiculous things like uh, used panties for Africa. Believe me, that's a threat. That's, a, that's an actual thing. Somebody's trying to put together panties for Africa. It's ridiculous. Or t-shirts, like your old t-shirts for Africa. It's, it's, it's really, really silly. Uh, when, you, when you think about, um, there are textile industries that are ages old in African countries. So really, uh, the key thing there is design with, not for. Now to the next part of my talk. Um, my friend and co-founder of Ushihiki, David Kobia, said access is an equalizer. And we've talked a little bit about, um, I think, at dinner and in some of the conversations, we've, we've been talking a little bit about diversity, equality, uh, and society in general. And, um, when he said this, it really left a mark on us that access is an equalizer. And um, when I also, th there's something that also my other co-founder, Eric, says, find a windmill to tilt at. And we find ourselves, we found ourselves about two years ago, um, looking at the windmill that we wanted to tilt at, which is access. Why? Uh, let's look at a few facts. Uh, there's a really vast market. 
right now. Um, <clears throat> These projections by the UN uh, of, of the children aged 0 to 14 in Africa going over, uh, from over 412 million and projected to be over, 1800, uh, over 800 million in 2050, these are staggering statistics. And when we look at how education is delivered in Africa specifically, we're looking at uh, pen and paper, uh, in some cases, Parents can get text messages of their children's uh, uh, test scores, but really there's a big opportunity here to change how information is delivered to children by providing access to the internet. Another fact as to why access is one of those windmills to tilt at, 76% um, of people in Africa are still not connected to the internet. Uh, those are staggering numbers. And for us in our backyard, in the place where we are, the problem that we deal with is often unreliability of power, of electricity, <coughs> something that we may take for granted here. But in, in Kenya, you often, and other African countries, you often have power blackouts. So what do you do? And you need the internet. So we decided to, um, to think about that problem of access and to think about that problem of uh, unreliability of electricity. And one more answer to the reason why access. And this quote by Kofi Annan, um, it, just the same way in when we started Ushahidi, we had access, we were able to collaborate and do things together. And that was really, really important. And to afford that, that opportunity to others. And one other question uh, as to why. Uh, there we go. Why do we use technology design for London and LA when we live in Nairobi and New Delhi? That was also part of the thinking around this. And uh, Eric sketched out some ideas. And another thing that drives us, uh, not just the Ushahidi team, but also the BRIC team and the I have uh, team, is to have the courage to do hard things. And um, why would we want to have the courage to do hard things? Because if it was easy, everybody would do it. And uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here today to tell you about our challenges. Uh, but that right there in the corner is the brick, which I'll show you here in a second. And this is a picture of a school uh, called Kawangwari. It's a small school about 30 minutes from the IHUB. And when we went there to talk to the headmaster, he said, look, We've got uh, coursework, we've got uh, radio hour where we get content from the schools on how to, uh, on uh, content uh, for the school from the government, but it's delivered through radio. And we have books uh, and we have a couple of tablets that were donated or we work, they work with a company called Elimu that uh, delivers content uh, to those tablets. But the problem is internet. And one of those solutions is to put together a backup generator for the internet, uh, just to be a little bit simplistic, which is um, a, a redesign of the router, right here, a redesign of the router, so that it has eight hours of battery life and you have a failover, so that when the main internet switches off because of a power fluctuation, it switches to 3G networks and creates a hotspot uh, that can serve 20 devices. Now, if you take that, and add a component using, for the geeky people in the room, we've got GPIO pins over here that you can use, uh, you can put, you can use, um, you can use it to push sensor data, but in this case, you can add a component that has uh, storage, you can even, it can have uh, content of up to two terabytes and additional battery life, and you can have content that you can serve up to the school, to the classes. And uh, we're doing this in partnership with Mozilla. And now you've got this, where you have children being able to access content on tablets and being able to learn. And this is one of the things that really inspires us, that it's not just about creating a for-profit company or a for-profit spin-off, that it's about the constructive value that we're bringing to these children uh, in, this particular, um, in this particular school. How many minutes do I have? Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know how much time do you need. Okay, <laughs> I'll be quick. 
All right, just a few more slides. And uh, one of the things that we're working on is this idea of creating opportunity. When we started out with Ushahidi, we started out as four co-founders. The company, uh, the group grew to nine people, then to 20 people, and then now to 40, uh, but yet with global scale. And one of the things is, um, when we're creating opportunity, one of the things is, that we're thinking about is, how do we do that? Um, we've, we've done quite a bit in creating a space for the software industry to thrive in Kenya, but there wasn't much that was being done for the hardware industry or the maker or inventor community. So along with Levinson Foundation, Autodesk Foundation, and a few others, we've come up with a space called Gearbox. It, it is part of the same building. So you've got the I have on the fourth floor. Uh, on the third floor, we've got an incubator called MLab. Uh, on the second floor, we've got Gearbox, uh, which is a, a space, uh, which will be a space for fabrication and rapid prototyping. And um, on the First floor, you've got the Ushahidi office and the brick office, and on the ground floor, uh, there's Akira Chicks. And that's just a, a microcosm of this emerging ecosystem that we hope to push forward by trying to uh, create a space for uh, inventors and uh, people who are doing interesting things in the hardware industry. <coughs> and the way that people can join in is, uh, one, if you're an inventor, there's an inventor in residence program. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where I think Germany's uh, amazing unfair advantage in engineering is great, and uh, CDTM would love for you to join us so that we can help to support the next generation of makers and inventors uh, and to, to, to help give them the, the um, to work with them to come up with innovative solutions and uh, scale up some of the work that they've already started doing. And uh, we've got several partners and we're always inviting others. Uh, to join us as, as partners. Mm -hmm. I will end with just a few thoughts on conditions for progress and lessons from our experience. And uh, one of those ideas is the people you build things with are super, super important. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to, uh, Joey calls this emergent leadership. And I learned for me that it's about working together to get what needs to be done, done. Uh, a quick metaphor is sometimes when you have a startup or running a young organization, you have to do the dishes because there's no one to go, you can't send somebody to go do the dishes, you just have to do the dishes and um, to, show, to, to, to show by doing. And I'd like for you to see uh, two of the closest uh, collaborators that I've been working with for the last couple of years. From Eric, I learned a lot from him. He's uh, an extrovert, a big guy with a red beard, and uh, he, he, he's an amazing thinker when it comes to strategy, but he, he taught me to, he helped me, um, I'm a little bit more introverted, and he helped me to, to be able to stand in front of you and talk to you without freaking out. <laughs> so uh, I owe a lot to him, and um, he, he also has an eye for design, and uh, in terms of strategic pos positioning or branding, he's very good at that. Uh, and uh, from David, he exemplified that sort of culture of mastery, that, uh, and he can build prototypes from scratch. He built the first Ushahidi prototype, and has helped lead development teams over the last couple of years. It's been really amazing to learn from, uh, from them, and the doggedness, the, the, like not giving up and just keep keep prototyping, keep prototyping. And that also brings me now to um, the case for spaces to prototype, but then also a culture of prototyping to solve a specific need. Um, the anchor organization of Ushahidi has led in one way to, or another to all the things. <coughs> so some of them are not as, you know, as big uh, but the thing is, when you, when you bring interesting, cool people together, uh, you can really, really have an impact and you can try and change things uh, from wherever you are. And uh, last but not least, the idea that the smartest people do not work for you. Uh, you cannot assume that the people who are volunteering time for you or are part of your network uh, do not assume that just because they're volunteering that they're amateurs. Uh, one of the biggest lessons that I learned about this fact 
was that um, in a few years ago when there was the New Zealand earthquake and uh, in Christchurch, and we had a community of developers joining in to help support a deployment of Ushahidi. One of them helped advance the code base for Ushahidi so fast because he was one of the, the smartest software co coders in New Zealand. And we had no clue until we found that, oh my goodness, he has done all this progress on this code base. So the thing is to, to keep that in mind and um, sometimes to figure out how to open up your problems to the, com the wider community to help you solve them. Uh, and that has specific um, applications in companies that uh, some scientific companies are using crowdsourcing through Innocentive to open up some of those tough problems to invite other sm uh, smart people that you may not realize it. Uh, but then they will solve the, the problem quite quickly. And there's also examples like Foldit uh, and a few others. But the, sometimes the smartest people do not work for you. And uh, find ways to involve rock stars that you don't know yet are going to be rock stars. And uh, to, uh, who are aligned with your mission and can help you to achieve your goals. And pay attention to interesting folks who are from the edge of the network. Uh, I am a product of the edge of the network and um, pay attention to some of those because that's where some of the interesting things are happening. And Africa is perhaps one of those frontiers uh, and uh, I'd really love to hear the questions that you may have. Thank you very much.